Thank you everyone for attending, participating. Um, my name is Aviva Salin. I'm an attorney here at EPGD Business Law. I'm here with Eric, the founding partner. A little bit about myself. I'm the managing attorney of our corporate department, which means I work on transactional matters. I help my I help clients start businesses for and um what we look at is we consider the structure structuring from a liability perspective. We plan we plan for tax liabilities and <clears throat> as well as for being general counsel to our clients. What that really means is we work with our clients on a wide range of matters. We help clients with um with contracting with employment issues with um with franchising with raising investments as well as with protecting their intellectual property. So that's a little bit about me and about our practice areas within the corporate department. I'll um let Eric introduce himself as well. Yeah, thanks thanks everyone. Um thank you for attending. So everyone who registered whether you can make it or not, we will share a copy of this presentation via email with you afterwards. Also, we're going to be recording it, so if anyone would like a copy of the recording, um, please feel free to leave uh, to ask questions. Um, sometimes we won't get to the questions till the end of the presentation, just in case maybe we happen to answer your question later on. Um, but we do want this to be interactive, so we'll open it up for Q and A at the end. This is uh, a new law. Um, real quick about me: uh, founding partner of the firm, started it uh, going on eleven years. I've uh, been very proud of what we've built, and a lot of it has been based on uh, finding really talented people to work with. Um, and so in Aviv's case, he's been with the firm over five years already and has really uh, matured and blossomed as an attorney. So it's a pleasure to work with him. And um, this topic that we're talking about now is going to apply to a lot of people, which you'll see in the next couple slides. Um, I, I won't steal Aviv's thunder, but this is a new law um, that a lot of people are going to need to be aware of. And then unfortunately, if you're not aware, there will be potential penalties. So Aviv, take it away. Yes. So... As Eric um, started, introduce, started introducing the Corporate Transparency Act, the law that we're talking about today is a law um, passed in 2021 and taking effect January 1st, 2024. So this is right around the corner um, and it's going to affect a lot of, a lot of companies, um, if not the majority of companies. Okay. So um, just a brief overview of what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about the, the purpose of this new law, the Corporate Transparency Act. Who does it apply to? Who does it impact? What are the requirements for filing? Who are the parties um, on the reports? What are the deadlines? And of course, as Eric mentioned, the penalties for not filing and not complying with the law. So as I just mentioned, Corporate Transparency Act passed by Congress in 2021 and takes effect 2024. And essentially what um, the purpose of the act is, is to deter bad actors, right? They're looking to the Congress and the Department of Treasury are looking to combat money laundering, tax fraud, other illicit activities. So who's going to enforce this? This is um, a filing with FinCEN, which is a bureau of the US Department of Treasury. The Director is appointed by the Secretary of Treasury and essentially serves at the discretion of the Secretary of Treasury and you know the secretary and directly under the Secretary for Terrorism and Financial Intelligence. So you know that that tells you a lot about what you need to know. They're really um, trying to crack down on um, money laundering, tax fraud, uh, money, especially money coming from overseas, as we'll talk about. Um, foreign agencies have access to this and. Um, foreign companies will be required to comply with this with this law as well. Um, Let me interject real quick. So this is straight from FinCEN's website. Their mission is to safeguard the financial system from illicit use and combat money laundering and promote national security through the collection, analysis, and dissemination of financial intelligence and strategic use of financial authorities. So before we dive too deep in, Many of you know that when you create a company, you can actually pick what state or what jurisdiction you're going to create it under, right? So if you're here in Florida, you're creating it with the Florida Secretary of State. Now, here in Florida, we have a lot of public information that's publicly available. The website is sunviz.org, and you can look up most companies. Now, 
If you do it right, you have to put at least one officer, director, or manager. You don't have to reveal who the owners are. Now, a lot of people who don't know what they're doing reveal who the owners are right there in the public information. But if it's done you know, with someone who has a little bit more savvy, I can have a manager. I might even hire an accountant or an attorney to be the manager. And the, why would I do that? Because I want to keep my name off the internet if I'm the owner. Take it one step further. There are other states such as Delaware, Wyoming, New Mexico, Nevada, where they don't disseminate any public information about the company, right? So I won't even be able to find an address or a name of a party, the, a, a person that's involved, an officer, a director, or manager. And there's good reasons for that. Maybe people prefer privacy, right? So a lot of my clients say, hey, I'd rather, prefer a Del I'd rather set up a Delaware company where no information is out there on me. Well, where this gets tricky, and I think where it's locked to being, is there's been a lot of transactions, a lot of real estate transactions where people are using these, these they're not shell companies, but they're companies that serve no other purpose. Um, and so people will go create a Delaware LLC, there's no public information, and then they'll buy and sell real estate. And I think one of the purposes behind this law is to try to step in and, and say, hey, hold on a second, who's actually, who's, like, let's follow the money. Whose money is actually changing hands here? Exactly. That's exactly right. And so before everyone freaks out on what's required here, what's what's required in the report to FinCEN is a disclosure of the beneficial ownership. And, um, you know, for those people that do have Delaware holding structures, Wyoming holding structures, and many other states that provide some anonymity, this isn't going to be a public database available to your clients, your creditors, whoever else um, may be looking for it. This is going to be a secure database available to government agencies, civil and criminal, financial institutions, and foreign government agencies as well. Um, and so essentially, again, the idea behind this is really focusing on criminal activity. And so the uh, governmental agencies will be able to access this for the purpose of investigate of investigations. <clears throat> so what is the impact of the Corporate Transparency Act? The impact is, um, well, it's going to impact most companies, as I said earlier. So who needs to file a beneficial ownership information report? Um, it, first of all, it's domestic companies. So any company that files articles of incorporation, articles of organization um, with any state, with any secretary of state in the US will have to file this report. Foreign companies, for example, a Mexican company that is expanding its operations and wants to start operating in the U.S., but may not want to create a, a separate subsidiary for operating in the U.S., they may register their company from in Mexico as a foreign entity in Florida. Well, once they file with the Secretary of State in Florida, they're now going to have to file a report for their for their company in Mexico. Other entities include limited liability partnerships, limited partnerships, statutory trusts and business trusts. If they file with the Secretary of State, um, as some of you may know, trusts aren't required to file with the Secretary of State, but um, they may choose to in certain circumstances to operate businesses. Um, excluded from the requirements are sole proprietorships, general partnerships, and most trusts, because they do not file articles with the Secretary of State, and really sole proprietorships or general partnerships are doing business in their personal name, the names of the owners. So there's nothing really to disclose. It's already um, out there. Even if a sole proprietor uh, obtained an EIN for the business, filed a DBA, um, has licenses for the business, if they're operating in their own name, not through an LLC, then um, they're not going to be required to file this report. Now, let me real quick interject. Um, if you've been paying attention to some of my videos or reading any of our blogs over the last 10 years, I would tell you never do business as a sole proprietor, right? Like that, that like one of the reasons why you go spend the $125 and create the LLC is to have limited liability. So um, I don't want to encourage people to go out and start doing business as sole proprietors or as general partnerships. Um, I, I I can't think of an example why you wouldn't want to have a company to protect you and your personal assets. Yeah, as all my clients know, I always recommend that you create a company 
you separate the liability from yourself. So there, of course, are exemptions from the requirement to file. And as you can see from this list, most of these exemptions correlate to having to fi file or be re or register with other federal agencies. So for example, publicly traded companies, um, um, broker dealers, investment advisors, they're all required to register with the SEC anyways. And so they're not required to also file um, this report with FinCEN. Um, similarly, banks, credit unions, money services, business depository institutions, they're all required to um, register with the Department of Treasury or FDIC um, anyways. And so they're not required to have this additional reporting. Now, there are a few um, exemptions we're going to talk about in more detail. One is tax exempt entities. Tax exempt entities include nonprofit organizations, so charitable organizations and political organizations as well. The reason they're not required to file the report is because they're not for profit, which means they technically don't have any owners. And so there is nothing really to report as far as beneficial ownership. And um, I'll interject that they are yes. regulated in other ways, mostly by the IRS. Um, quick little side story. Somebody uh, put in their will that they wanted to make a big donation to a charity. And then they went to the charity and said, hey, can you make a gift to my to my brother in law? And the charity, and, the, and then they asked me if I could do that. And I'm like, I don't think that sounds like a charitable purpose. You might get in trouble with the IRS. Yes. Um, and I see we, we have a hand. I'm going to ask that um, any questions are put in the chat as we may get to them. Um, we may dis discuss your questions later on. And at the end of the uh, presentation, we'll, we'll answer all the questions. All right, so then we have some of the other exemptions that um, may be more of um, more companies will fall into are, for example, large operating companies. So this includes companies with 20 plus full-time employees, and that means real employees as defined by the IRS, so W-2 employees who have taxes withheld from their paychecks and um, work under the employer's control. So not 1099s. Not independent contractor 1099s, that's right. Um, also, another requirement is that gross receipts or sales have to be, you have to report 5 million or more in gross receipts or sales on your tax returns for the company. And the company must also have a physical presence in the US. So using the example I brought up earlier of a company from Mexico expanding into the US, while they may have hired 20 full-time employees and may um, and may have gross receipts or sales from the US from US revenue um, and in in the range of five million dollars or more, then they may be exempt, but only if they actually open a physical office, which, they may choose not to, right? They may hire 20 full-time employees who are all remote. So uh, I guess I've got to ask my law firm, do you think I, I mean, I think we qualify as a large operating company. Uh, is there, uh, does it matter when the company was created? Is there any sort of deadline on that? So it does not matter when the company was created. Um, so does EPG have 20 full-time employees who are W-2? We do, yeah. Is that, do we have more than fifty, more than five million in gross receipts or sales? I think so. Yeah, and we have a physical office. I'm sitting in it right now in the U.S. So good. I'm not yes, we would fall into the exemption. <laughs> One less report to file. Okay, good. Um, so another exemption is for inactive entities, and this really means inactive. So. You know, if you're thinking of your real estate holding company that holds a piece of real estate and hasn't really transacted any business in the last five years, hasn't rented the property out, it just holds it, that's not going to apply here um, because as we'll get into it, there are six requirements. One, the company must have been opened before January 1st, 2020. Um, 
It must not be engaged in active business. It cannot be owned by a foreign person. So if it's owned by a foreign person, this exemption will not apply. The business must have not experienced any change in ownership in the last 12 months. So, you know, no bringing on partners, removing partners, or, or um, even transferring ownership interest in a substan substantial way between the partners. And uh, has not sent or received any funds in an amount greater than $1,000 in the last 12 months. And does not for real estate. And if you have to pay real estate taxes, I mean, it's going to be more than a thousand bucks. Yep, exactly. So right there um, is one reason why a company, a company holding real estate won't qualify. And number six specifically includes or excludes any companies that hold any kind of asset. So what this is really considering is if you had a business maybe eight years ago, um, that you started, you ran for a few years, and then you decided to close the business. But for whatever reason, you decided to keep the, the LLC or corporation active in the state. You filed an annual report each year, but you haven't really transacted any sort of business. Um, whatever money has been sitting in the account has just been there. Then an entity like that, it would be an inactive entity and exempt from this reporting requirement. Um but presumably you're keeping that entity alive because eventually you intend on doing business. So once you do start doing business, you will have to file the report. So we're going to look at some more complex structures here. This is an exemption that's available for what's called a pooled investment vehicles. Pooled investment vehicles fall under the Investment Company Act. And under the exemption 3C1 or 3C7, it's an uh, investment company that only raises money from certain individuals. And usually that what you're looking at is accredited investors. So if you raise money only from accredited investors in an investment company, then you'll um, fall into an exemption with re from registering with the SEC. However, you would still have to file what's called form ADV with the SEC which is why there is still an exemption here. However, what this exemption doesn't provide is um, it does not provide an, an umbrella or blanket exemption for its subsidiaries. And so as you can see here, a pooled investment vehicle that is exempt would not have to file the report. However, a wholly owned subsidiary of that pooled investment vehicle that it's not that is not itself exempt would have to file the report and that report would include the ownership information or the um, information of those who substantially control this business. And so we'd have to go look at the pooled investment vehicle or its owners and directors to figure out who, who controls this business, right? And file the report on behalf of this business. And then if that subsidiary owned another subsidiary that's not itself exempt, Again, we'd have to go through the same the same exercise. We'd have to see who are the owners. And so if we look here, we see another entity owns it. And then once we're here, we have to find the individuals who own it or control it. And we'd have to file a report on behalf of this entity. If that subsidiary then, for example, owned a large operating company, like we just discussed EPGD is, then that, that entity, the large operating company, would be exempt by way of having its own exemption. Separately, oh, oh sorry. Yeah. No, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to elaborate. So, accredited investors. This is actually a definition. Um, it's defined by the SEC, and what it is is they've created a definition of who they consider sophisticated enough to not need the protection of the SEC in a lot of circumstances. So, the the current definition is they have to have earned income of more than two hundred thousand dollars in each of the last two years with a reasonable expectation of doing the same next year, or if it's a spouse, $300,000, they must have a net worth of over a million dollars, either individually or together with a spouse, excluding primary residents, and they must be considered knowledgeable, um, and that's, uh, that's uh, or I'm sorry, it, or they are a knowledgeable employee of a private fund, um, or a professional, a financial professional with a series seven, series 65, or series 82. So if you're one of those people, then you count as an accredited investor. And a lot of times when we do these pooled investment vehicles, 
they're structuring them in a way that they don't want to register with the SEC. So they're only going to target accredited investors. And usually they make the accredited investor sign a questionnaire, um, uh, basically swearing that it's all the truth. Um, let me ask a quick question of you. This structure you have right here. If I got rid of those two non-exempt companies, is there a way I can make this where the whole thing would be exempt? Well, yeah, if the if the pooled investment vehicle, which is itself exempt, owned a large operating company, which itself falls into an exemption, then yes, this they both would be exempt. Neither would have to file a report. And then separately over here, we included another wholly owned subsidiary that happens to be inactive. And so long as it's inactive by the definition provided in the Corporate Transparency Act created before January 2020, um, doesn't conduct any business, hasn't transferred any ownership, hasn't transferred or received funds in the last year, then that itself would receive would um would be exempt from filing the report. Okay, that that answers my question. So the the point is there could be a way to do this to to keep everything exempt. Exactly, exactly. And so um, what we'll look at next is certain um, exemptions do provide what's called what they call a blanket subsidiary exemption. And so looking at this structure, a public company is exempt. So a company traded on NASDAQ, New York Stock Exchange, that's registered with the SEC is exempt. And the public company does provide a blanket exemption for its subsidiaries. So looking first at this wholly owned subsidiary over here, that may not itself fall into an exemption, that doesn't matter because it's wholly owned by an exempt public company. So it receives the, the benefit of the exemption. And same thing for the wholly owned subsidiary of that subsidiary, because looking up the chain, we go to the, we go to the ownership and see that the public company is exempt because the public company already has everything listed in the public records, right? Now, going into a little bit more complex structure, if the public company were to own 90% of a subsidiary, and the other 10% is owned by a registered investment company, which is also exempt and also provides a blanket exemption, then this subsidiary is exempt. Now, if that subsidiary owned 90% of another company and the other 10% was owned by a private investment fund that's not exempt, then this subsidiary is not exempt. This subsidiary would have to file a beneficial ownership information report and on that report, we'd have to list the individuals who are the owners and who con sub sub substantially control this entity. And so we'd have to go up here, look at the public company and figure out who of these directors and individuals owns a substantial portion of this and who really controls this. And so we'd have to look at the public company. We'd have to look at the registered investment company. And we'd have to look at the private investment fund to figure out who's making the decisions here and report those individuals. We don't report companies, we report individuals on the report. And same thing if that entity then owned a subsidiary, once again, we'd have to go through the entire structure and figure out who are the beneficial owners and list those people on the reports. So how should companies prepare for the Corporate Transparency Act? What companies should do is update their corporate documents. And so governing corporate documents are your operating agreement, your shareholders agreement, your partnership agreement, um, bylaws, and more. And what we should be looking to include in those, doc in those corporate documents are representations, covenants by shareholders, members, partners, that they agree to comply with the Corporate Transparency Act and cooperate with the entity in, um, in providing all the information that's needed to file. Now, another important provision in, in these agreements should be an indemnification agreement by the shareholders or members that if they essentially promising that if they don't cooperate, if they don't provide the information necessary to file the report, that they will defend the company and the other partners um, for penalties for their failure, right? Let's say we have an entity that has four partners and we need to disclose all four um, on the beneficial ownership interest information report. And one of them doesn't provide the information that we need, doesn't provide um, all the documentation, then 
the company is not timely in filing its reports and is it assessed penalties, that shareholder should be held responsible for that. And that's how what we can achieve in the corporate documents by uh, amending and updating those. Um, we should also have a consent from all the shareholders members consenting to the fact that we're going to um, provide their information and it is personal information on this report submitted to FinCEN. Okay. So the filing requirements. So essentially what we're going to be looking at is first of all, determining the qualifications, right? Are we required to file the report or are we exempt? Right, the some of the exemptions we just looked at. Then we're going to need to obtain a lot of information from the owners and um, on who actually controls the business. And then we will file the beneficial ownership interest information report through FinCEN's boss program. It's an online program, so it should be user friendly, hopefully. However, we don't know because again, this has this takes effect January 1st, 2024. So nobody's filed one of these reports. Um, I don't know anybody that's seen the actual platform that we're going to have to go through. So um hopefully it's user-friendly and easy to easy to file. And then so we'll receive that's a big leap of faith of you. Yeah, yeah. Considering I, I have never figured out how to log into the IRS website ever. Um, <laughs> you know. Well, we can hope. <laughs> um, and then, of, of course, we'll get a, we'll receive a certification um, that the information is correct, accurate, and if anything is incorrect, of course, we'll have to amend the filing and correct any any inaccurate information. So, what is what do we actually have to report? Right. So, we have to first of all report information on the company itself. So that's you know, the articles, the date the company was formed, um, what state it's in, things of that nature. We have to report information on each beneficial owner, as well as information on the company applicant. And I'll explain what the company without who the company applicant is. So the information on the company itself, we need to report the full legal name. We need to report any and all trade names, DBAs, fictitious business names, as well as current addresses and um, an address for the principal place of business cannot be a PO box. So we need a real address to report. Um, for foreign reporting companies, we'll need the jurisdiction where they first registered. So in the example I used earlier of a company from Mexico, we'd also have to include their reporting, their registration in Mexico. And then um, an IRS tax ID, that's usually your employer identification number for the company. Um, and if the company doesn't have one in the U.S., then the foreign tax ID. As far as information on the beneficial owners, we'll have to include the full legal name of each individual, their date of birth, their address of residence, and an ID number from a uh, dri driver's license, U.S. passport, um, U.S. ID card. If they're a foreign person, we can we can use a foreign passport, um, and we'll need an image of that. We'll need a photo of that um, documentation to be submitted. And again, this is only individuals. We're not disclosing ownership, as in a holding company owns this company. We need to actually provide the individuals who control and own the and own the entities. So if you had a company that owned a company that owned a company that was owned by me, you would have to disclose the information about me. All three companies would have to file three separate reports and each one would report you, Eric, as the beneficial owner. Okay. And then information on the company applicant. So this is only applicable to, um, to companies created on or after January 1st of 2024. Um, so the same as the beneficial owners and the as far as the the information that needs to be provided and who is the company applicant it's the person who's actually filing the registration with the secretary of state so oftentimes that's me right i file the, i'll uh, i'll file the articles of organization or the articles of incorporation on behalf of my clients and so I'd have to include my information or our law firm's information as well 
on that report. Now, again, like I said, this takes effect. This specifically takes effect only for companies created after January 1st, 2024. So you don't have to go figure out who filed your articles of organization 15 years ago or go chase down your old lawyer. Um, so for all new for all new companies, this will be a requirement. So who are the parties? As I just went through a little bit, the parties are the company, the owners, and the company applicant. So who are the reporting companies? As we went through a little earlier, it's almost all companies, right? Corporations, LLCs, anybody filing um, registration with the Secretary of State, as long as you don't fall into the 23 exemptions, then you're going to be required to file this report. Who are the beneficial owners? This is where things can become very nuanced. Beneficial owners are either people who directly or indirectly exercise substantial control over the reporting company or who own a certain amount of, uh, of equity in the company. I'll get to the equity soon. As far as individuals who directly or indirectly exercise control, this includes senior officers. So your CEO, your president, maybe even your general counsel, if they actually have control authority to bind the company, um, and um, and authority and more authority than other officers, for example, right? So, what what may happen is you may have a board of directors, but one of the directors is the chairman, and that chairman may, at his discretion, be able to remove all the other directors and appoint new ones. Then, who is exercising substantial control? It's probably just that one director, not the entire board of directors, right? So it's um, an analysis of what is what is actually happening in practice in the business on a day to day basis, not just what may be provided for in corporate documents. So it's as I said, senior officers, those who have authority over the appointment or removal of senior officers, or appointment or appointment or removal of directors. It's also somebody who directs, determines, or has substantial influence over important decisions. So if we can't go take out a loan without that one officer's permission, then that one officer probably exercises substantial control. As well, anybody who has any other form of substantial control. So any other form is a catch-all that they include here on purpose, of course, because if somebody else doesn't have any interest on paper or isn't a director on paper, but is really the person that we have to go through for all decision-making, then we need to disclose that person, report, file, file that person as a beneficial owner. Reminds me, I had a client uh, once who knew this, he did this before I got involved, just caveat, but um, he knew he was going to be sued. So he put everything in the name of his mother, but he was still the guy behind the scenes, puppet master, controlling the company i think his mother didn't know anything she might not even known that she was listed as the owner and the officer and the director and the manager but she had nothing to do with it it was all him still doing everything so he would be exercising substantial control even if he has no ownership and he he'd have to report but he'd have to be reported as a beneficial owner on the on the form on the report and we'll um, penalties on if he doesn't because he's probably not going to well then you can uh we'll we'll address that at the end. <laughs> but there are others who might exercise substantial control are individuals who directly or indirectly, including somebody who is a trustee of a trust, exercise substantial control through board representation, ownership of majority of voting power, um, rights asso rights associated with financing agreements, control over intermediary en entities. So, you know, we might have an intermediary entity or an agent who um who issues um orders on what on what to do but they're really just a puppet of another person then that person that person who's actually um exercising control is the one that needs to be reported um so you know a lot of what i mentioned earlier anybody who um who we have to go through for most 
ma major decisions, that person's going to have to be listed um, as a beneficial owner. And of course, we we can and likely will many times have to list multiple beneficial owners. Um, separately, somebody who directly or indirectly owns or controls at least 25% of the ownership of a company is also going to be a beneficial owner. And ownership interest is really any instrument, contract arrangement. It's not just, I own 25% of the shares of this company. It's, um, it's also a profit interest, right? So if I own, if I don't own any of the company, but I have the rights to 25% of the profits at the end of each year, maybe through a commission, I'm going to be considered to be owning 25% of that company. Um, this also applies to convertible instruments. Convertible instruments are instruments that essentially provide that I don't own, I might not own anything right now, but it could convert into interest, into equity in the company. If the convertible instrument allows me the possibility of having more than 25% ownership of the company, then I have to report this, even though I don't own it now. Um, and say, excuse me, same thing applies for um, options, right? Employee stock options. The employee may not have any ownership today, but if their stock options allow them to own eventually 25, at least 25% of the company, then that needs to be reported and that individual needs to be listed as a beneficial owner. Um, and this is going to get complicated. It's definitely can get complicated. And, um, you know, again, there is a catch all here. Any other instruments, contracts, arrangements, or understandings? See, see how they um, use broad language on purpose. It's not just what's in your operating agreement, what's in your employment agreement. It's what are the actual, what, what's actually happening in practice? Who's actually walking away with 25% profits at the end of the year? Who's actually controlling the business? That's what um, this is focusing on because as we talked about earlier, you know, um, bad actors may create a company with, maybe their mother or maybe a friend and own 1% of the company. So they don't own 25% of the company, but they're exer they have 100% of the voting rights. So they're exercising control or they're receiving 90% of the profits at the end of the year. So that's what um, FinCEN is looking at there. You know, it, it's not something that you can avoid by just saying, well, no, I only own 10% of this company. We're going to have to look at what's actually happening in practice on a day-to-day -day basis in the business. Um, separately, if a trust holds at least 25% of the ownership interest in a reporting company, then all of the following people are considered beneficial owners. The trustee, um, anyone else with authority to dispose assets, if a, a beneficiary who's the sole permissible recipient of the income, so if you have a trust that owns a company and the beneficiary is your, your son and your son is the only beneficiary, your son would have to be listed as a beneficial owner. Um, any beneficiary has the right to demand distributions. So if you have multiple beneficiaries and one of them has the right to um, demand distributions at any time, then that person would have to be listed as a beneficial owner. And um, lastly, a grantor who has the right to revoke the trust. So as some of you may know, what is typical in the estate planning world from an asset protect from, from a succession planning purpose is a revocable trust. A revocable trust is a, a separate entity from you. It's, but it, in a sense, it's a legal fiction. And because of the fact that you can revoke it, you still technically own everything. And so you would still have to be listed as um, a beneficial owner on the on the report with FinCEN. That's right. And in terms of the IRS, all income uh, for, of a revocable trust is taxed to the grantor. Yeah, that's right. So a few exemptions from beneficial owners, uh, minor children. So remember, I, I just used an example of a trust with uh, benefit with um, a child or a son as, as a beneficiary, if that person is a minor, we wouldn't report, we wouldn't provide their personal information. We'd provide the information of their um, parent or guardian. 
um, future contingent interest. So inherent inheritance that might come about doesn't um, is exempt from from this requirement. However, of course, once you actually acquire the ownership interest, we'd have to update the report and um, provide and and report that person as a beneficial owner. Um, people who are not beneficial owners, something I, I touched on earlier, nominees, intermediaries, custodians, agents. If these people are mere um, middlemen who take orders from the real beneficial owners, then we'd have to still report the beneficial owners, not the uh, nominees or custodians. Um, employees are typically not going to be listed on the as beneficial owners unless they're senior officers or directors who exercise substantial control in the business. And then creditors are not going to be um, beneficial owners even in the event that a creditor might have a promissory note, a loan secured by stock of the company, let's say it's secured by 50% of the stock of the company, then that creditor might be able to one day own 50% of that company if the company or the owners default on the loan. But um, that um, just because there is a security against that interest, that does not make the creditor a beneficial owner for the purpose of this report. Of course, if the creditor then does um, does pursue that and take that 50% ownership, control the 50% ownership, then at that time, the creditor would have, we'd have to amend the report and the creditor would have to be listed as a beneficial owner. So who are company applicants? I touched on this a little bit earlier. It's the individual who directly files the document creating the company. So this is the person who files the articles of organization or articles of incorporation in the state. Um, like I said, a lot of times that's me or our team. And so on top of reporting the beneficial owners, we'd also have to report ourselves as the company applicant. And again, this is only for new companies after January 1st, 2024. So if you don't remember who filed your company that you created five years ago, it's okay. You don't have to go track that person down. Reporting deadlines. So any company that's created before January 1st, 2024 has the entire year January of 2024 to file this report. They have to file by January 1st, 2025. So all companies in existence today, doesn't matter when they were created, have a year to file this report. Any new companies created January 1st, 2024 have 90 days from the date that their entity is active. So once you file your articles of organization, you then receive back registered registered filed articles, right? That the SunBiz or whatever Secretary of State you filed with has approved them. There will be an effective date on the public database for, for a company in every state. And that will calculate 90 days from that effective date. And you have 90 days to file the report. After January 1st, 2025, that timeline goes down to 30 days. Um, so same timeline, you file your articles, you receive an effective date, you have 30 days from that date to file the report. I know what some people are thinking. And the first thing I thought is, um, well, a foreign person may file our, may file for a company and then wait more than 30 days just to get their EIN, but they need their EIN for the beneficial ownership information report. What um, what FinCEN's guidance is, which it's, um, frankly unhelpful, but it is, is what it is, um, is that foreign persons who know they're going to, um, create a company in the U S should start by first obtaining an ITIN from the IRS. So it's a little bit backwards from what we've been doing for forever. Um, but that what that is FinCEN's guidance on um, how to make sure you can still comply with thirty with thirty calendar days. Um, and then, of course, 
if a company was exempt but is no longer exempt for whatever reason through ownership change or through no longer being registered with certain agencies, um, then they'll have 30 days to file the exemption, to file the report from the date that the exemption no longer applies. And we have the penalties for not filing or for filing late and or filing um, incorrect information. So if you unlawfully or willfully provide or attempt to provide false information, or you direct another person to file false information, then there are civil penalties. The penalties um, are $500 per day, up to $10,000. And on top of that, there's, um, there's the potential for two years of jail time. Um, so they, the government is taking this seriously. And um, if, so if we unlawfully or willfully hide someone's information or provide false information on who the actual owners are or exclude one of the owners from the report, those all can be um, can be penalized in this way, five hundred dollars a day, and up to two years in prison. Um, this is federal prison as well because this is a law passed by Congress. And so we have to consider this when um, we create companies with partners. Right, we need to make sure everybody is on board, understands what their requirements are, so that we can comply. Especially, you know, once January first, two thousand twenty-five hits, thirty days is not a long time. It flies by. You're going to create your company, get the articles, get the EIN, go to a bank, start open a bank account, and by the time you actually start doing business, it's already been thirty days. And you may have forgotten. So, um, you know, this needs to be top of mind. And the violations apply to the individuals and the entities. So, of course, the individuals can receive criminal violations and um, entities and individuals can receive the uh, civil penalties. Um, then, of course, you have to update the report consistently. Anytime you change ownership in the business, um, then you have 30 days from the change from the change to update the report with with FinCEN. So, so let me give an example. Yeah. So I create a company for myself. No, no, you create a company for me, and I'm 100. percent um, And I have somebody else who's going to be the manager. So we have to disclose all three of us, right? You have to disclose yourself as the applicant. I'm the beneficial owner. And then the other person is the guy that's running the company. Then both, you both later, be listed as beneficial owners. Okay. So then three months later, I decide to bring on another partner and now we're going to be 50, 50. So we're going to have to do an update to the form when we bring on a new 50% owner. Yes. And while we call it an update, it's actually just filing the form all over again. We'd have to. What if, what if I change lawyers? Do I have to have a new applicant? put in up their information? On no. So the company applicant relates to the person who filed the articles in the state, not the person filing the report with FinCEN. Okay. And then three months later, I add on uh, another 25% partner. Then I got to update the form within 30 days and so on and so forth. So every and time if one of you, came... and if that person came on a 25% and one of you, the two existing partners went, um, were diluted below 25%, then, you know, that, that person may be excluded. Okay. All right. Thank you. Of course. Um, so if you file an erroneous report, essentially realize that maybe something you reported wasn't incorrect, then we have 30 days from when you become aware of it to, to fix the error. Um, if you're exempt, well, if you're exempt, you don't have to file this. However, if you file the report and then later become exempt, then we can file a we can file a new report 
of informing FinCEN that we're now exempt. A minor beneficial owner. So again, if a, if we have a child that owns part of a company, we don't have to report the child. We report the child's parent or legal guardian. Um, but once that child becomes of age, turns 18, we then have to update the report to include the child. And then, of course, if somebody um, were to pass away, then we have to update the report within 30 days of their death. Um, that's for substantial control. We have 30 days from the date of their death. As far as ownership interest, we have 30 days from the date the estate is actually settled. So if you're not familiar with how this works, um, when someone passes away, the um, when the heirs would typically have to open a probate, go to court, and a judge would um, distribute the assets of that person pursuant to a will or intest intestate law. And so once the assets are distributed, including the ownership interest, you have 30 days from that time to update the report for beneficial ownership. Um, and then if a company is dissolved or terminated, there's actually no, no need to report. We don't have to notify FinCEN that the company is now dissolved. And we can... Um, receive a FinCEN identification number, identifying number to for updating these reports. Um, it's not a requirement to obtain this, this ID number, but um, most companies likely will be assigned one. So again, updates, corrections, we have 30 days to um, to File to file new reports. And um, that brings us to the end of the PowerPoint slides. Um, this is my contact information right there is my email. If anybody um, has any questions, I'd be happy to um, find a time to discuss in more in more detail. Of course, we're going to open up the Q and A section here shortly. I'm going to leave this slide on for another couple seconds in case anybody. Hold on, let me try the QR code. Hey, it worked. What does it take you to? It takes me to a contact us website, uh, information about this uh, webinar, um, and it looks like a bunch of other, uh, a bunch of other links to things on our website. You can nice. go to our top page. Cool. Yes, that's new. And this is Eric's, um, contact information as well. I'll leave this on here for a minute. So, all right, let's check it, see if there are any questions of you. Yes, I have a few here. Okay. Um, so I have one question here about if a company is suspected of tax evasion or money laundering, what are penalties? Um, so as far as tax evasion, money laundering, of course, an investigation can be opened and the departments, um, probably FinCEN, will be able to use the database to identify owners so who um, have... 25% ownership or exercise substantial control over the business. As far as penalties levied for tax evasion or money laundering, um, you know, that's that's com that's not com um, considered in this law specifically, but there are of course strong um, high penalties and specifically jail time for tax evasion or um, money laundering. Let, let me say this, and when it comes to the Department of Justice, they have a 97% conviction rate. It's it's really, 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 really high because they get all their ducks in a row before they uh, bring any charges. They've already got the wiretaps. They've already got access to all the financial information. Um, and, and you can actually look at 
the different de uh, Department of Justice offices and right on their website, they'll have headlines of like charges brought and this many counts and then uh, and then follow it through with convictions. So this is just going to add to it, right? And I just can't even imagine how much manpower they're going to need just to sift through just to sit through all these uh all this information yeah um well you know the you would think that the irs already has a lot of this information right every company files a tax return with a k1 with the owners listed but clearly the manpower isn't there to utilize that information um in in the way that the department of treasury wants to to actually combat um, I mean, I these bad actors. There are 6.1 million employers in the United States. And that's not even thinking about all of the LLCs that just own a condo or don't really do much else. Yeah, I mean, it's it's going to be a substantial amount of filings that they're going to have to, um, to go through. Um, another question here, if you have a corporation and you are likely to dissolve it by January 1st, 2025 or sell the corporation to someone else should you still file the report so if a company exists before january 1st 2024 you have the entire year of 2024 to file the report the report does need to be filed and if you intend to sell the corporation to someone else you still need to file the report and once that new person owns the company that new person should will then have to update the report Right, whoever the buyer is will have to update the report, from um, removing you, and um, putting themselves or whoever the substantial owners are. Um, and then I have another question here: What if my business partner is supposed to file but doesn't or does it wrong? Am I on the hook? So yes, all the beneficial owners are on the hook for their for filing this report. Um, which is why we discussed specifically the uh, provisions to include in the corporate in corporate documents. So we can appoint one person who is responsible for filing the report and have that person indemnify the company, and as, as well as have all of the shareholders members agree to provide all the information necessary on a timely basis. And that if they don't, they will be responsible for. Um, the penalties. Now you can pass civil penalties along to them, right? If if the if FinCEN issues you a penalty of two thousand dollars for a few days of of uh, not filing the report, you can then go after them under your contract for that two thousand dollars. However, if FinCEN actually um, enforces criminal jail time, imprisonment. That's something that you'd be on the hook for personally and won't be able to waive a contract at the Department of Justice saying, no, this person is supposed to indemnify me, right? They're not going to serve jail time on your behalf. Now, what will likely happen is you, um, both of you may have to serve jail time for not filing the reports, but um, you know, this is important. And um, you know, I, I will say the... Um, the way these penalties often work is usually starting with civil penalties. And then if there's really willful disregard for the civil penalties and the violations just continue, then, um, you know, jail time could, um, could come about, but it's not likely that upon a first or second violation, you're, you know, you're going to, um, be prosecuted for, um, for, for imprisonment. Anyone else has any questions? This is the time. So I just did some Google research. Here's what I found. This is interesting. There are 1.7 million C corps in the US, 7.4 million partnerships and S corps, 21.6 million LLCs, 23 million sole proprietorships, and 33.2 million small businesses, which is defined by the Small Business Administration as having 500 or less employees. That's 99% of all new businesses. And in 2021 alone, there was a record 5.4 million new businesses created. So just think of every one of those businesses is going to have to do all this extra paperwork. It's a lot of reports. 
yeah. it's a lot of reports. Um, I do have another question here. Um, looks like I got a couple more here. Um, one is you mentioned creditors are exempt, even if their loans are attached to a promissory note that could grant them 25% or more equity upon default. Does this apply, for example, to an investor who crafts a convertible bond instrument? So the um, report would apply to an investor with a convertible bond instrument as they are they would be treated similar to um, an employee with a stock option, right? Because the conversion the, or the, the point of the instrument really is the investment into the company. And so whereas a creditor is actually providing a loan with an expectation of repayment, a convertible bond instrument is the expectation there really is that they're going to eventually receive interest in the company. Um, and the purpose of the, of the instrument really is for, um, for equity. Um, what is going to be the timeline to file the report starting January 1st? Would you be offering the services? So first of all, yes, we will be um, offering a service of filing these reports on behalf of companies. We'll be happy to discuss um, discuss on, on, a, on a consultation how we can help. Um, as far as the timeline to file the report, any company that's created as of today whether created this year, last year, or 10 years ago, if it's an active company, it's going to have to file the report. And we have until the end of 2024 to file that report, right? So um, any company that's exi that exists as of today, we have about a year. We All new companies from 2024, we have 90 days. From 2025, we have 30 days. So, um, you know, the sooner the better. We're going to um, send out more information about this as the platform opens up, the online filing system opens up, and um, we're able to see a little bit more about how intuitive the the program is, and in that way, be able to um, you know assist our clients. Do we expect any legal challenges to implementation of this law? Is there any chance Congress repeals this law? I highly doubt it. Um, I this uh, remember this was um, passed in 2021, so it's already been about three years, and um, we haven't seen any major challenges in the court systems. So I um, I don't think it's likely. I think our government, you know, is looking to really crack down on national security terrorism, money laundering. And um, that's the reason for this law. And, you know, to a certain extent, it's, um, it's leaning more and more towards um, what many other Western modern governments are doing nowadays, right? In the EU or in many countries in Europe, all of this information is public anyways, or most of it. So I'll, t I'll give it an anecdote. I moved to Miami in 2009 and I moved into a high rise building downtown. And when I first moved in, I was renting from the developer and I would just drop off my check at downstairs. Then one day I got a letter under my door that a, uh, from now on, I should be directing my rent payments to some random office up North in Fort Lauderdale and in the name of some random LLC. So I walk into the management office. I'm like, Hey, what do you guys know about this? And they're like, yeah. A couple guys from Argentina showed up with two suitcases full of cash and bought four units in our building, sight unseen, uh, with uh, and just created an LLC, right? And so, where did that money come from? Who are those people? You know, and now all of a sudden they own real estate. And if you think about it, that money could have been dirty. And then they own real estate. They're first of all going to be collecting my rent checks for a while, and then when they sell it, that money becomes clean because now it's going to go through some other title company or lawyer's uh, escrow account. Um, so I, I can see the purpose and I've never heard of a government giving back power once they get it. Yeah. Um, I have another question here. This is an interesting question. I've actually been asked it a couple of times. Um, what are your feelings on CPAs, accountants filing this on behalf of their clients, or should this really only be um, filed by attorneys? Um, so in FinCEN's guidance, 
they do specifically include accountants as people who will likely file this report. So um, I don't believe that as a blanket statement, filing this report is the practice of law. However, certain complex structures will require some legal analysis on the on on the corporate documents, on the operations of the board, um, to to really figure out who are all the beneficial owners. And so, while uh, LL, a single member LLC is going to be easy, and probably just about anyone can file for more complex structures, um, we may be getting into the the practice of law. And of course. Um, accountants, other professionals want to avoid practicing law without a license. So, this is a good answer. I mean, the reality is we know that many accountants are very good and competent at creating companies. Um, but they, you know, I think we should all stick to our comfort zones. And if there's something that looks really complicated, you just tell your client, "Hey, client, I'd really like to get a, a, an opinion from a lawyer so I don't make a mistake." Of course. Um, I think that's all the questions we have here. All right. Well, Aviv, I want to thank you. I know you did most of the heavy lifting, guys. He did all the work. This is his presentation. Um, so thank you very much. And someday, if I take the credit for it, I'll secretly be giving you, uh, you know, quiet credit. But great work. And everyone, we will share the presentation. And anyone who would like the recording, uh, once we clean it up, we'll share it with you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for attending. Thanks, Eric, for um, co-hosting. And I look forward to discussing this topic more with anybody who's who's interested in in finding out more. Thanks, everyone.